Well, hello and welcome to the second episode of Bread Theory. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, so tonight we're going to do the same sort of thing we did last time. We're going to listen to chapter two of the Communist Manifesto. Uh, and we're going to you know, pause along the way and, and talk about it, uh, try to apply it to modern life and, and some of the theories that we've been talking about in the last video. Uh, those, those theories, just to recap, are a synthesis of uh, new urbanism and uh, anarcho-communism as well as permaculture. So we're trying to put a lot, all those theories together uh, and synthesize something new, which I call Solaris, uh, which means of the sun. It, it represents interconnection and uh, life. And uh, it, it's what I feel is kind of the, at the, the core of each of those theories. Um, that's the, the one thing they all have in common. So using that framework, we're, we're going to be playing Majesty, uh, which is a real-time strategy game. Kind of the unique twist on Majesty, Majesty is that uh, instead of, you know, grouping up a bunch of your heroes or whatever and then telling them exactly what to go do, you instead uh, recruit and then incentivize. So you do like a, a, an attack flag or a, a explore flag and then they have their own free will. So they, they're kind of just out in the world. They have to survive by their wits and, you know, there's, there's only limited interventions you can actually do. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. It's, it's a game that I've liked for some time. It's from, I believe, the late 90s. So, uh, yeah, it's really fun, too. Uh, one thing you might want to look for tonight, one of the fun things about that game is each character has its own name, and it's just randomly generated. So you'll get, uh, say, it's like one of the Earth guys, the, the, the cultists. It could be like a Pequant Wound, or if it's a... Uh, uh, one of the uh, necromancers, it could be like Sister Nightwing, or whatever. It just it, a random combination of first and last names. It's just kind of a fun thing that the, the game did. They have a lot of fun stuff like that. So keep on the lookout for that. Um, and then with, with that, with no further ado, I think we can probably get started. Resolution full screen. It's causing the frame rate drop or something. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to just play around with it more. Maybe it's just the, the computer that's that's making the lag happen. But uh, I am using a different streaming service this time. I'm using OBS instead of Streamlabs. So on the test run, it went a lot better. So hopefully we're going to, you know, keep that, that good luck going. And uh, there won't be too much of a trouble. All right. So but with that, let's go into the game. So here is Majesty, and I'm going to go ahead and cut the music. And we're going to bring up, I'm going to, oh, got to bring the audio up for the desktop audio. Let me know if the, the background audio is too loud or too soft or whatever. You can always adjust it. So here we go. Uh, chapter two of the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Section 2 of The Communist Manifesto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Section 2. Proletarians and Communists. In what relation do the communists stand to the proletarians as a whole? The communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties. They have no interests separate and apart from those of the proletariat as a whole. They do not set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. The communists are distinguished from the other working class parties by this only. 1. In the national struggles of the proletarians of the different countries, they point out and bring to the front the common interests of the entire proletariat, independently of all nationality. 2. In the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeoisie has to pass through, 
they always and everywhere represent the interests of the movement as a whole. The communists, therefore, are on the one hand, practically, the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of every country, that section which pushes forward all others. On the other hand, theor I think that's a, an important place to pause just for a second. Uh, what, what Marx and Engels are laying out right now is definitions of, of what class is to them. Um, in our modern day, we, we tend to think of class only in terms of economics. You have your lower class, your middle class, your upper class. There's no real other distinction between that except for what you have or do not have. And so what they're laying out is instead class is the, there's basically just two classes. There's the proletariat, those that are workers, and there is the bourgeoisie, those who are owners. So that could be anything from the, what, what's called the, the petty or the petite bourgeoisie, which is things like uh, small shop owners, small business owners, uh, basically the, the people that, well, they technically own, they don't have a lot of money, or, or, or power influence in society, and then there's just the regular bourgeoisie, which is all the, the large factory owners, the large business owners, people of great wealth. But they're still both part of the bourgeoisie, and also an important distinction is it's, it's not about really money at all, that distinction. So you could have, uh, say, a, a doctor or a lawyer who um, works uh, for a firm or for a law firm in the case of a lawyer or for a large hospital in the case of a doctor and they may make good money but still because they're not owners they don't have the same power in their everyday life that, that an owner would so they would still be considered part of the proletariat let's continue theoretically they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march the conditions and the ultimate general results of the proletarian movement the immediate aim of the communist is the same as that of all the other proletarian parties. Formation of the proletariat into a class, overthrow of the bourgeois supremacy, conquest of political power by the proletariat. The theoretical conclusions of the communists are in no way based on ideas or principles that have been invented or discovered by this or that would-be universal reformer. They merely express, in general terms, actual relations springing from an existing class struggle, from a historical movement going on under our very eyes. The abolition of existing property relations is not at all a distinctive feature of communism. All property relations in the past have continually been subject to historical change consequent upon the change in historical conditions. The French Revolution, for example, abolished feudal property in favor of bourgeois property. The distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. But modern bourgeois private property is the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and appropriating products that is based on class antagonisms on the exploitation of the many by the few. In this sense, the theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. We communists have been reproached with the desire of abolishing the right of personally acquiring property as the fruit of a man's own labor, which property is alleged to be the groundwork of all personal freedom, activity, and independence. Hard-won, self-acquired, self-earned property. Do you mean the property of the petty artisan and of the small peasant, a form of property that preceded the bourgeois form? There is no need to abolish that. The development of industry has to a great extent already destroyed it and is still destroying it daily. Or do you mean modern bourgeois private property? But does wage labor create any property for the laborer? Not a bit. It creates capital i.e., that kind of property which exploits wage labor and which cannot increase except upon condition of begetting a new supply of wage labor for fresh exploitation. Property, in its present form, is based on the antagonism of capital and wage labor. Let us examine both sides of this antagonism. To be a capitalist is to have not only a purely personal but a social status in production. Capital is a collective product, 
and only by the united action of many members, nay, in the last resort, only by the united action of all members of society, can it be set in motion. Capital is, therefore, not a personal, it is a social power. When, therefore, capital is converted into common property, into the property of all members of society, personal property is not thereby transformed into social property. It is only the social character of the property that is changed. It loses its class character. Let us now take wage labor. The average price of wage labor is the minimum wage, i.e., that quantum of the means of subsistence which is absolutely requisite in bare existence as a laborer. What, therefore, the wage laborer appropriates by means of his labor merely suffices to prolong and reproduce a bare existence. We by no means intend to abolish this personal appropriation of the products of labor, an appropriation that is made for the maintenance and reproduction of human life, and that leaves no surplus wherewith to command the labor of others. All that we want to do away with is the miserable character of this appropriation, under which the laborer lives merely to increase capital, and is allowed to live only in so far as the interest of the ruling class requires it. In bourgeois society, living labor is but a means to increase accumulated labor. In communist society, accumulated labor is but a means to widen, to enrich, to promote the existence of the laborer. In bourgeois society, therefore, the past dominates the present. In communist society, the present dominates the past. In bourgeois society, capital is independent and has individuality, while the living person is dependent and has no individuality. And the abolition of this state of things is called by the bourgeois abolition of individuality and freedom. And rightly so. The abolition... That's an important point. That, that's still how they view it today when you, when you talk about doing things like organizing your workplace or, or forming a cooperative or something like that, they're like, oh, well, that, that, that's less freedom. The only kind of freedom they're actually thinking of is, is the freedom of the owner. Uh, but it, it doesn't take too much thought to realize that workers don't have that much freedom under that system. They, in fact, have very little at all other than what's given to them by uh, the government through regulation and by um, and just by the, the employer because they, they need to have the, the bare minimum of, of uh, workers' ability to keep reproducing their work. Uh, so when you talk about collectivizing, uh, from a capitalist point of view, well, that's, that's less freedom because it is. You know, it's less freedom for them, but it's a lot more freedom for a lot more people. So an important thing to keep in mind. Abolition of bourgeois individuality, bourgeois independence, and bourgeois freedom is undoubtedly aimed at. By freedom is meant, under the present bourgeois conditions of production, free trade, free selling, and buying. But if selling and buying disappears, free selling and buying disappears also. This talk about free selling and buying, and all the other brave words of our bourgeoisie about freedom in general, have a meaning, if any, only in contrast with restricted selling and buying, with the fettered traders of the Middle Ages, but have no meaning when opposed to the communistic abolition of buying and selling, of the bourgeois conditions of production, and of the bourgeoisie itself. You are horrified at our intending to do away with private property, but in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine-tenths. You reproach us there. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Nine-tenths of, of people don't really have any private property beyond perhaps the car. That, that's about all that they have, and that's only if they use their car as their means of production. If it's just transportation to and from work, that's just personal property. That's an important distinction, again, to, to make that. Personal property is, is what you own for your own subsistence, your own, you know, it could be your, even your leisure, but it's, it's just for your own life. Uh, private property is 
what you use to make a living to, to generate money to uh, you know to make a, yeah to make a living that's, that's a, a good way of framing it so for most people and it's still true here what 150 oh, coming up on you know yeah about 150 years uh, later and and that, that's still true most people don't really own any private property at all so so all Marx and Engels are talking about is hey let's have more ownership let's have more property uh, private property in in more and more hands to the point where there's the, the concept of private property is, is done away with because everybody is an owner of something some piece of, of their business therefore with intending to do away with the form of property the necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In one word, you reproach us with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so. That is just what we intend. From the moment when labor can no longer be converted into capital, money, or rent, into a social power capable of being monopolized, i.e., from the moment when individual property can no longer be transformed into bourgeois property, into capital, from that moment, you say, individuality vanishes. You must therefore confess that by individual, you mean no other person than the bourgeois, than the middle class owner of property. This person must indeed be swept out of the way and made impossible. Communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive him of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriation. It has been objected that... Indeed, that's another important thing that most people don't think about, is how much work do owners actually do for their own property, or for, for their own uh, subsistence? And how much of it are they just taking by... Just the, the coincidence that they happen to be the ones that, that own the, the private means of production. Uh, I mean, people like to use in, in recent times Jeff Bezos. Like, do you really think he works however many billion times harder than his average worker to amass that huge fortune? Uh, no, of course not. And, and at, at some point, way below being a billionaire, that, that just becomes ridiculous of a notion that you work that many times harder than your other employees to, to make the business money. No, the people that actually do the labor, the people that, even in the service industry, the people that are performing the services, people at, at a call center or um, EMTs, or it doesn't matter really what the field is, the people that are actually making the money, doing the things that make the business money, are only getting a fraction of the profit that they generate and that's after you take out for the various expenses of running a business that's, that doesn't even that's that's not even including that I mean that, that that doesn't factor in they still are only getting a fraction of, of the excess that is generated that upon the abolition of private property all work will cease and universal laziness will overtake us According to this, bourgeois society ought long ago to have gone to the dogs through sheer idleness. Absolutely. Absolutely. If the lack of a profit motive made people lazy, then how are there so many owners? How are there so many landlords? A landlord is a great example. What exactly does a landlord provide? It doesn't, they don't actually do any work to keep up their own buildings. They, they contract that out. They don't do any of the leasing for the most part, unless they're very small time. And even then, that's a very little bit of labor. Uh, you are the one, it is your labor as a renter that, that goes to the, the monetary upkeep of your property, of, of not your property, the landlord's property. So what exactly do they do with their time all day? I mean, they, they have all these, these funny ways of looking at it. They, they talk about it as, oh, well, I have investment properties. Oh, this is, you know, uh, my money is working for me. They, they have all these little cute phrases that they like to, to pull out to justify and kind of uh, cover over the fact that they're not really doing anything to get their money. They're just 
because they have land, they take your money. Now imagine if we didn't have land liens. Uh, what would happen then? It, there would be all kinds of properties that were on the market. And if you think that somehow things would be more expensive, well, then you're not really thinking it through. Because in order for a landlord to, to make a profit, they have to take more from you than it costs for the mortgage and to pay all their employees and you know so on and so forth. So the cost of all housing would go down if we were to just do away with the, the landlord form. And if you, if you go on any real estate website, you can find, uh, just take whatever size apartment you're in right now, uh, say it's a, a, a two bedroom, you can find a two bedroom house that's much bigger, much more modern appliances that actually has land that comes with it in your area. I guarantee it. You can find plenty of properties that if you were to buy them would cost you less than money. Even when you take into, into account you know, extra expenses, um, you know, uh, homeowners insurance, uh, upkeep of the, the, the property, paying all the utilities, all that stuff. It, it has to be because, like I said, in, in order to make a profit renting out uh, an equivalent space, you have to jack up the price or where is your money going to come from? If your landlord only paid you the bare minimum of what it costs to maintain that property, then they, there would be no landlords. It would not be a profitable business. So they're just a, a useless middleman that makes it harder for you to be an owner because somehow the, the, the banks and the, the government has decided that poor people, it's okay if they, they sign leasing agreements and you know we're going to trust their worthiness of, of paying their rent month after month and year after year. But when it comes to a mortgage, we have to be much more strict and strenuous about it because, well, you know, that's a real big deal. It's, it's garbage. It, it doesn't make any sense when you, when you pull back and look at the, the bigger picture. You already are paying a mortgage, even if you're renting. You're just paying someone else's mortgage. So keep that in mind. For those of its members who work, acquire nothing. And those who acquire anything do not work. The whole of this objection is but another expression of the tautology that there can no longer be any wage labor when there is no longer any capital. All objections urged against the communistic mode of producing and appropriating material products have, in the same way, been urged against the communistic modes of producing and appropriating intellectual products, just as, to the bourgeois, the disappearance of class property is the disappearance of production itself, so the disappearance of class culture is to him identical with the disappearance of all culture. That culture, the loss of which he laments, is, for the enormous majority, a mere training to act as a machine. But don't wrangle with us so long as you apply to our intended abolition of bourgeois property the standard of your bourgeois notions of freedom culture, law, etc. Your very ideas are but the outgrowth of the conditions of your bourgeois production and bourgeois property, just as your jurisprudence is but the will of your class made into a law for all, a will whose essential character and direction are determined by the economical conditions of existence of your class. The selfish misconception that induces you to transform into eternal laws of nature and of reason social forms springing from your present mode of production and form of property, historical relations that rise and disappear in the progress of production, this misconception you share with every ruling class that has preceded you. What you see clearly in the case of ancient property, what you admit in the case of feudal property, you are of course forbidden to admit in the case of your own bourgeois form of property. Abolition of the family. Even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. We're going to have to spend a moment on, on what this. foundation is the present family, the bourgeois family, based? On capital, on private gain. Yep. In its completely developed form, this family exists only among the bourgeoisie. 
but this state of things finds its complement in the practical absence of the family among the proletarians and in public prostitution. The bourgeois family will vanish as a matter of course when its complement vanishes, and both will vanish with the vanishing of capital. So another important historical note, uh, the rise of the so-called nuclear family, which, you know, you have just, you know, basically the two parents um, and the, the 2.4 children, if you're an American, whatever it is in your country, if you're from somewhere else, the rise of that coincides pretty well with the rise of capitalism. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, for one thing, uh, when you have an extended family, you have a lot more people that you can rely on uh, if you ever get in trouble. Uh, if you have, you have a lot more adults, let's say, contributing to the, the upkeep of a household um, as compared to a nuclear family. Uh, but then also, if you atomize the family, let me back up one second. Uh, so before the nuclear family, the standard would be the extended family. You'd have people that would live at home for quite some time. It was never, it was really frowned upon. You know, people get married, they move into their each other's family's houses, um, things of that nature. People relied on on their extended family a lot more. And there wasn't things like nursing homes, uh, or the, if there were, they were for richer classes. Um, so the thing about that though is that it's when you atomize that and you break it apart and you make it into its smallest basic unit, you have a lot more customers. So now in, just to use a more modern example, if we had an extended family system still, you might buy one TV for the household. But if you break it apart into many nuclear families, you can have a TV for each household as well as, uh, you know, an apartment for each household. You know, again, let's, let's bring it back to, to renting. Um, if you notice, there's there's a base rate for, say, a, a one-bedroom apartment, but then a two-bedroom apartment is not twice as much. But it is more conducive for something like an extended family. So just an interesting thing to, to think about there. Um, Oh, one more point I want to make on that. Uh, when you have a, a nuclear family and you, you're keeping people further apart, you're making them work harder because they have to support more than they would if they were, there were more hands to share the load. Um, you keep people more tired, uh, which keeps them from thinking of things like organizing. And you keep them physically more apart. You don't see each other as much on the average if you're in a, in, extended, in a nuclear family than you would in an extended family. So again, you keep the people apart, you keep them buying more stuff, uh, and you keep them from realizing their power more. Do you charge us with wanting to stop the exploitation of children by their parents? To this crime, we plead guilty. But, you will say, we destroy the most hallowed of relations when we replace home education by social. And your education, is not that also social and determined by the social conditions under which you educate, by the intervention, direct or indirect, of society, by means of schools, etc.? The communists have not invented the intervention of society and education. They do but seek to alter the character of that intervention and to rescue education from the influence of the ruling class. The bourgeois claptrap about the family and education. And again, uh, education, as, as much as we like to dress it up as being about building well-rounded humans, and, and it, it is that very much too, but a major component of education is training uh, the workforce of the next generations. So, um, teaching you how to be obedient, how to, to follow orders, how to stay in line, how to do an assignment, do what you're told, that sort of thing. Just thought I'd mention that. About the hallowed correlation of parent and child becomes all the more disgusting the more 
by the action of modern industry, all family ties among the proletarians are torn asunder, and their children transformed into simple articles of commerce and instruments of labor. But you communists were this also was a time of when women. Was written, when this the was whole written, was child labor was pretty course. common. So the bourgeois sees in his wife a mere instrument even worse of production. At that point. He hears that the Thankfully, instruments of production some of the worst are being parts exploited in common, capitalism. and naturally can come to no other conclusion than that the lot of being common to all will likewise fall to the women. He has not even a suspicion that the real point is to do away with the status of women as mere instruments of production. Okay, so this, this is the, the another rest, part that's... Uh, nothing is more ridiculous than... Pause the one second. This is another part that's often misunderstood when they're talking about the, the breaking up of the family and the freeing of women. Again, at this time, women didn't really have any rights. They certainly couldn't vote. I don't believe anywhere in the world they could vote uh, in the late 1800s. They, they couldn't own property in most places either. Their fates were tied to their men. Um, so what, what Marx and Engels are talking about is freeing them from that oppressive order. And, you know, of course, you bring it into the modern lens with LGBTQIA issues. And if you imagine not fitting into one of those heteronormative uh, situations with one man and one woman as, as the head of a family and that being the only allowable thing. I mean, if you just don't fit into that, you either accept a life of self-denial and, and repression or you risk everything. Um, if we were to still have that, that sort of a system. So what they're talking about is, is breaking that apart for the betterment of the women of the time. Um, and again, capitalist society has taken a different route. They don't have the same egregious uh, infractions that they used to. But still, was, we still have the nuclear family. We still are very much, still very much a heteronormative society in a, capitalist world so I mean that, that's changing little by little but it's it's definitely not being led by the interests of capital and capitalists virtuous indignation of our bourgeois at the community of women which they pretend is to be openly and officially established by the communists the communists have no need to introduce community of women it has existed almost from time immemorial. Our bourgeois, not content with having the wives and daughters of their proletarians at their disposal, not to speak of common prostitutes, take the greatest pleasure in seducing each other's wives. Bourgeois marriage is in reality a system of wives in common, and thus, at the most, what the communists might possibly be reproached with is that they desire to introduce in substitution for a hypocritically concealed and openly legalized community of women. For the rest, it is self-evident that the abolition of the present system of production must bring with it the abolition of the community of Good women point. springing women from that system, to vote since the 1920s. of prostitution, both uh, so public and private. Only the last hundred years have women even been able to vote. It's with taken desire that to long abolish to countries and nationality rest from the grip of the, the capitalist the country, rights for women. We cannot take from them what they have not got. Since the proletariat must first of all acquire political supremacy, point, must rise to be the leading class of the nation, must constitute itself the nation, it is, so far, itself national, though not in the bourgeois sense of the word. National differences and antagonisms between peoples are daily more and more vanishing owing to the development of the bourgeoisie, to freedom of commerce, to the world market, to uniformity in the mode of production and in the conditions of life corresponding thereto. The supremacy of the proletariat will cause them to vanish still faster. United action of the leading civilized countries at least is one of the first conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. In proportion as the exploitation of one individual by another is put an end to, 
the exploitation of one nation by another will also be put an end to. In proportion as the antagonism between classes within the nation the vanishes, idea there, making things equal uh, among people, uh, both in terms of rights and material comforts, uh, that leading to an equality among nations, that comes from the idea that, that uh, a big reason that you engage in things like imperialism is because of the appetites of, of the wealthy. And that's definitely true. Although I don't know how much just making things equal in one nation uh, necessarily makes it a, not a non exploitative nation of others. I mean, you can take, for example, Sweden, one of the, the favorite examples of uh, a social democracy. It's like about as far left as you can go and still be within capitalism proper. Um, and, you know, they, they, they don't have homelessness there. They, they have basically, if you want a job, you can have a job. There's very strong union participation. Basically, a lot of the things that they were talking about um, in early communism are things that they have and, and very strong. But, but they also still rely, even, you know, from the bottom to the top, they rely on the exploitation of poor nations for various trade goods, um, for labor, for a number of things. So they're not without their faults. So the idea that making things more or less equal is going to necessarily do away with uh, inequality among nations, I, I have to take a little bit of issue with that. I think that's more wishful thinking than uh, how things actually do come out in practice. And it's one of the reasons that um, people further left than, than social democracy or than, than social democrats will say things like, just, you got to do away with capitalism if there's ever going to be true human freedom because it's just it's just impossible to, to not exploit other people and, and still have capitalism going you have to, there always has to be people to exploit even if it's not within your own nation that's the idea so you know and they'll say you know so why even fiddle with uh, democratic levers you know why worry about all this stuff when what we really need to do is, is just have a revolution. But I mean, I don't know. I have my own issues with that. We'll get into it probably more later on. I like to keep things moving along though with this chapter. The hostility of one nation to another will come to an end. The charges against communism made from a religious, a philosophical, and generally from an ideological standpoint are not deserving of serious examination. Does it require deep intuition to comprehend that man's ideas, views, and conceptions, in one word, man's consciousness, changes with every change in the conditions of his material existence, in his social relations, and in his social life? What else does the history of ideas prove than that intellectual production changes its character in proportion as material production is changed? The ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. When people speak of ideas that revolutionize society, they do but express the fact that within the old society, the elements of a new one have been created, and that the dissolution of the old ideas keeps even pace with the dissolution of the old conditions of existence. When the ancient world was in its last throes, the ancient religions were overcome by Christianity. When Christian ideas succumbed in the 18th century to rationalist ideas, feudal society rough. fought its death battle with the then revolutionary Hasn't bourgeoisie. Quite succumbed entirely. The ideas of religious liberty and freedom of conscience merely gave expression to the sway of free competition within the domain of knowledge. Undoubtedly, it will be said, religious, moral, philosophical, and judicial ideas have been modified in the course of historical development. But religion, morality, philosophy, political science, and law constantly survive this change. There are besides eternal truths, such as freedom, justice, etc., that are common to all states of society. But communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion, 
and all morality, instead of constituting them on a new basis. It therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experience. What does this accusation reduce itself to? The history of all past society has consisted in the development of class antagonisms, antagonisms that assumed different forms at different epochs. But whatever form they may have taken, one fact is common to all past ages, viz. the exploitation of one part of society by the other. No wonder, then, that the social consciousness of past ages, despite all the multiplicity and variety it displays, moves within certain common forms, or general ideas, which cannot completely vanish except with the total disappearance of class antagonisms. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional property relations. No wonder that its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. But let us have done with the bourgeois objections to communism. We have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling as to win the battle of democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degrees, all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, i.e., of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total of productive forces as rapidly as possible. Of course, in the beginning, this cannot be effected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of property and on the conditions of bourgeois production, by means of measures, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and untenable, but which, in the course of the movement, outstrip themselves, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order, and are unavoidable as a means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production. These measures will, of course, be different in different countries. Sound and image quality are good, says Perennial Green. Content-wise, I'm looking forward to the next chapters. Well, there's only basically one more chapter after this. The, the last part is, is basically just like a, an epilogue. You know, it's just tying up a, a couple loose ends. It's only, I think it's only like four or five sentences or paragraphs. Um, so the next one's going to be kind of taking it all home. Um, you get to hear just a, just the briefest hints of of actual theory like most of this has just been kind of laying out the basics setting up the world view uh for what's to come kind of the, the entire point of this this manifesto is just to intrigue people enough to get them to say oh hey what's this communism thing i hear so much about let me let me go search out some people who uh are into that that's that's the main point of it so you know it's not not a lot of high level concepts High level ideas, as Dave Rubin would say. I think at this point he would have to go into reboot mode. Even with this, just, just this little bit. So let's continue. Nevertheless, in the most advanced countries, the following will be pretty generally applicable. One, abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. Two, heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Three, abolition of all right of inheritance. Four, confiscation of the property of all emigrants and rebels. Okay, so these are just basic things uh, about how, what will go down in, in the, the beginnings of a revolution. Um, so they talk about the, the confiscation of people that are running away. So that's like, you know, you got a rich family, you're trying to get out of the country because things are no longer favorable or favorable to you. Uh, you, you just, if you, if you get caught, then you can get your stuff confiscated because you are just trying to undermine uh, the new way, the way things are, are going. And so they feel justified in, in taking your property for that. Can't say I would blame him. He's basically trying to smuggle things out during a war. So, um, and yeah, abolition of inheritance tax. That's just to break up dynasties. It's it's or, uh, not inheritance tax. Abolition of inheritance, inherited property. Uh, and again, they're not talking about personal property. So you know, 
your family house you can still get to inherit, uh, your family car, anything that's not being used for the means of production, you would still get to keep. That's, that's not what they mean by abolition of inheritance. What, what they're just talking about is, you know, you don't get to keep the family factory. You don't get to, you know, we're not going to set up private dynasties that way. That's, that's not at all what this is supposed to be about. So that's all that is supposed to be right now. Five. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state so by means bank. of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. And the, the Six. importance of that centralization quickly, of the means. The, the, the importance of a, a centralized bank would be the the notion that they are running not for profit, uh, not to fleece the, their poor customers or uh, enrich their their already rich ones, but to just have a, a basic. A basis for for anyone to do commerce um, without being gouged by things. That, uh, I, I don't know if they had. They probably didn't have overdraft fees at that point. But in the modern day, that would be what it would mean. You wouldn't have things like overdraft fees. Um, you would have access to credit in order to to start enterprises as long as they they met the guidelines of being worker owned. Uh, things like that. So that's, that's all they're talking about when they talk about nationalizing the banking system. of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Seven, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands, and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Eight, equal liability of all to labor, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. 9. Combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries. Gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equable distribution of the population over the country. 10. That, free education. I mean, even if you believe in equal distribution of the, the people across the land to make things more equitable, uh, it's not really a practic practical at least with our, our modern population. Um, th there's just not enough arable land for everyone to have a homestead. And it's just, in general, turns out it's not a great idea to just throw a bunch of people onto the land that have not a whole lot of interest in, in farming. Um, so, you, I mean, you, you can end up with things like famine and some pretty pretty nasty results. So that's, that's I can see where they're coming from. They, they, they want to you know, spread out power and spread out people as much as possible. But I, uh, I just don't think that's very practical or, or you know, worthwhile. Like, I think it's great if people want to live in cities. I think cities are great. It's the reason I went into urban planning. So. And for all children in public schools, abolition of children's factory labor in its present yeah, form, thank combination of education with quiet. industrial production, and etc., and etc., when, in the course of development, class distinctions have disappeared and all production has been concentrated in the hands of a vast association of the whole nation, the public power will lose its political character. Political power, properly so called, is merely the organized power of one class for oppressing another. If the proletariat during its contest with the bourgeoisie is compelled, by the force of circumstances, to organize itself as a class, if, by means of a revolution, it makes itself the ruling class, and as such, sweeps away by force the old conditions of production, then it will, along with these conditions, have swept away the conditions for the existence of class antagonisms and of classes generally, and will thereby have abolished its own supremacy as a class. In place of the old bourgeois society, with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. End of section two. All right, and that wraps up chapter two of the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Um, oh, one thing I, I don't think I mentioned in the last stream uh, this is a public domain book, 
and it is, it is spoken by volunteers at the, uh, I guess they're a nonprofit. I don't really know exactly how they're organized, but they volunteer with this group called LibriVox. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X, means free voice. Um, and basically they just volunteer to read mostly public domain works, and then they just put them out for free to the, the public. So you can go to, I think, LibriVox.com. Uh, there's also an app, a great app. I've downloaded all kinds of stuff. Um, they have a lot of, of good theory books from across the, the political spectrum. If you're interested in seeing how other people think or don't, uh, there's there's plenty to, to dive into there. And uh, you can also volunteer with this group too. So in fact, uh, there's a number of, of titles such as uh, Lenin, State and Revolution that are not represented in their collection. So if you have any interest in volunteering, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that is, is in the public domain that they just haven't had anyone to read for yet. And I'm not quite sure, I haven't looked into it myself, but I would imagine that if there's a particular book that you would like to read, that it's a, a not too difficult to get involved with that. So yeah, go ahead and check out LibriVox. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X. Uh, find them on YouTube. That's where I've accessed this particular recording. And they do quality stuff. It's, it's you know, it's great. It's like it's like having a worldwide free library of audiobooks. That's, that's exactly what it is. Um, so very much like their work, very much impressed with what they do. So yeah, so that wraps up chapter two. So we, we have a little bit more of the unfolding of, of a little bit of theory about uh, what they're talking about when they're talking about communism. They, they talked about things like the abolition of the nuclear family. Uh, of course, modern day detractors will try to make that into abolition of all family and just have some sort of state run thing where they snatch your children out of your arms and like before you even know it, they, they, they're property of the state, everything goes to the state, blah, blah, blah. That, that's not at all what they're talking about. Uh, what they're talking about is, is really, uh, hey, look, here's another parallel. Abolition versus a different way of framing things. Uh, so what they're talking about when they say abolition is, is uh, expanding. It can be more accurately described as expanding the concept of the family rather than uh, doing away with. Uh, just like there's a lot of heated argument. I, I don't know if it's always heated, but there's a lot of, of argument about if ab uh, abolition of police forces is the, the best way to say it, rather than something different like unburdening. Now, some people literally mean abolition, and I, I definitely can see where they're going with that. But uh, what I tend to agree with is, is a more pragmatic approach of unburdening of the police. So taking a lot of the functions that the police used to have uh, or that they currently have and giving them to more appropriate um, more appropriate uh, service providers. So I'm just going to pause the game for one second so I can pull some stuff up. Um, so there's, there's actually a great example in history of this. Uh, it used to be that there were no such thing as Paramedics. There's no such thing as, as medical first responders. That the police would would perform that duty. Um, I wish I had I had pulled this up ahead of time, but there's a great podcast. Uh, uh, that, that's it's on the history of the, the uh, EMS. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, and basically, the police were terrible at first responding. They were not trained. There was no such thing as training for that sort of thing. The, the, the concepts of uh, even being in something as basic as CPR had not been invented yet uh, or developed yet. Uh, how to keep people al alive, um, even things like not moving someone who had potentially has a fractured bone. Uh, none of these things were around. 
I listen to so many podcasts that it all kind of washes together. But there was a great podcast on the history of how it developed in Pittsburgh. And basically, these people just started doing it. They, they worked with a professor of, of medical sciences to develop what the EMS, uh, the emergency medical services, was even going to do. They developed vehicles and, and methods for, for treating people and uh, they were all, also they, they happened to be uh, a group of, of black volunteers who were doing this and one of the main reasons for doing this is because of the disparate treatment the unfair treatment that they were getting from the police when a black person would be injured and need their, their services black people have much more higher mortality rate um, when they were in need of, of emergency medical services than white people in Pittsburgh. And so these, these volunteers, they would go out and they became known in the neighborhoods as, as people that would take care of other black people and, and had a, they had a much higher success rate than the police to the point where the townspeople, or the, townspeople the, the, the people of the city got mad that, that, oh, how come black people get such a good service when all those white people are dying at the, you know, on the way to the hospital? And stuff. They did so well that they made people mad at them. Uh, but eventually, the, this, this concept of, of doing emergency medical services spread out across the country. And it, it became a way that, that police were unburdened with the responsibility of doing something that they were pretty crappy at. And if you look at many of the things that the police are tasked with doing today, things like wellness checks, things like um, just traffic enforcement, there's no reason to bring a gun into 99.9% of traffic situations. The most you would even have to do most of the time is uh, say they speed off, you get their license plate, and then you track down the owner of the car and you send them a bill or you send them a summons to court or something like that. Um, there's many, many services that the police do that they're bad at, that they acknowledge the fact that they would not like to have to do, that only heighten the danger of, of whatever situation they're put in, especially when it's coming to things like mental health, um, wellness checks, uh, stuff like that, that you could just call it unburdening the police and funnel the money that, that goes to that into other services. In fact, I don't have the statistic pulled up for this either, but a very, very small percentage of police's time, including all the paperwork that they do, is in dealing with any sort of violent crime. It's 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 something like between 10 and 20 percent of, of a given police force's time. And again, including the paperwork, not just the in, dealing with the incidents themselves, but, but the paperwork and everything is actually in dealing with violent crime. So imagine taking all the money that it takes for them to do all the other stuff and redistributing it to other uh, services that were more prepared and would have a better success rate, frankly, than them. Uh, and just saying, hey, you know, in, instead of a 911 call going to the police for these services, it would go to whatever new service there is uh, or existing service that could pick up the responsibility. Um, so yeah, so bringing it all back, uh, when they talk about abolition of the family, that's kind of a poor term because what they don't they don't mean just breaking apart family bonds altogether. You know, you stamped with a a barcode on your head, and you are now just a number in the government's vast machine uh, at birth. No, what they mean is expanding the concept of family, making it not just nuclear family, making it more what people naturally form into. Whether that be extended family, family of choice, uh, different sort of parental arrangements, all sorts of stuff, and you know, I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. that. That sounds like a pretty good society to me. Instead of adhering to these rigid standards that so often leave people financially destitute, leave people feeling lonely. You know, imagine how much uh, just through living with more people. That, that uh, how much less loneliness there would be in the world. Um, so keep that in mind when, when people bring up these phrases like abolition of the family, stuff like that. You can, you can tell them you know what the real deal is on that. 
Um, so yeah, so that, that, yeah, chapter two. Get just a, the brief little hints of, of actual theory, but uh, yeah, we're not going to get into real meat and potato stuff until we come back along to another book. And uh, there's a book by Ingalls, uh, whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, I think it's Principles of Communism, something like that. And that book is more like what people expect when they, they pick up the manifesto. They expect to uh, basically be treated to uh, complete more of a, a nuanced and, and articulated version of, of what communism could be. So that's probably the next communist book we're going to come across. But of course, we're going to alternate back and forth. Once we're done with the Communist Manifesto, the next book is going to be Peter Kropotkin's The Conquest of Bread. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. He, he, he does go into theory quite a lot. We'll get into that next. It is, it's a very good book. Uh, it inspired me probably more than almost any book, except for Ursula K. Le Guin's um, The Dispossessed. Which I... So before I go, before I, I send you to someone else, I thought, I think I'm just going to give you uh, how to contact, uh, uh, not how to contact me, my, my various links to my social medias. Uh, you just got to go to Linktree. It's a, it's a pretty cool uh, website where you can put all your links up. So if you just go to l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory, just as you see it there on the screen, you can find links to my Twitch, my YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can buy my art, which right now is the best way to support my work. Uh, and if you do decide to buy my art, just keep in mind that the art prints, uh, like the actual photos, are, are the items that I get the biggest commission from. But hey, no, if you want to have a really cool mug or, or you know, a mouse pad or the, the yoga mats with my stuff on it too, uh, yeah, please buy that too. And you can get something cool. Well supporting me and, and this work and also my photography at the same time. Uh, I'd like to also show you my the left signal boost, which is the database uh, that's been co-created by a bunch of different Facebook groups, including uh, the two that I manage, uh, left signal boost on Facebook and also left pod posting. So there's a whole bunch of different categories. This just right here is the, um, YouTube one. So it's it's user created. Uh, it's been crowdsourced. Uh, you can in fact add your own stuff. And if you have any sort of whatever medium you like, whether it's Twitch, whether it's YouTube, whether it's uh, podcast, what, whatever it may be, come here. There's, there's probably a category for you. Uh, and you can learn about a whole bunch of different leftist creators. And there's links to each one of them. Uh, it's just a service that, that we do to help. And even for people that, you know, know a lot, like this, uh, the YouTube category, we just reached 300 entries. So there's 300 uh, left YouTubers that are, are listed in our database. So more than you could ever keep up with. I mean, <laughs> I don't even try anymore. I just kind of, you know, see something I like and I, I go with it. Um, and then there's my... Oh yeah, so here's my photography. All sorts of products that you can buy my art on. If you need your photography. So come and check that out. That's on Society6 slash Zach Ellsworth Photography. And yeah, that ought to do it for this week. So again, thank you for joining me. I hope you, you learned something. I hope you thought about something from a new angle. Uh, and until next time, Back to time, friends.